I can um, I can remember some of our early days at Community Praise Center Church and this little skinny guy then with a bald head named Paul Heflin <laughs> would come and sing for us. Paul, bless you, man. Sister Wright and I are always blessed by your, by your ministry. I want to extol, thank you, Elder Winston, for first of all the invitation and then for the gracious introduction. Thank you for not reading all that stuff. It doesn't mean anything if you can't preach, you know. I want to thank Elder Winston and his team. The gracious invitation of Elder Ruff on behalf of Elder Winston and the team, the way you've cared for us. But I want to just extol one gentleman in this congregation who has always been one I especially admire for his longevity and service to the Lord, a former president of this field, Elder Robert Woodfork. Woody, as we affectionately called him, chaired the meeting where I was elected conference president many years ago. June 4, 2014, I celebrated 50 years of full-time ministry in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. At 72, I just didn't have enough sense to quit. So after 20 years at CPC, I've now become the pastor of the Tacoma Park, Seven Adventist Church, four weeks ago. And we're trusting the Lord to do mighty things at that place. Well, enough of that. Your theme, praying times for praying people. I think that we should deal with that. My subject, God hears prayers in Babylon. Let's pray. Help me, Lord. Amen. Let's go back to the book of Jeremiah, the 29th chapter, which was read in our hearing. And this is a text, Ella Woodfork, that people read, they like to, uh, Elder Winston, testify on this text, extol it, expound, Elder Nixon, for I know the thoughts. Some of you know it by heart, for I know the thoughts uh, that I think toward you, saith the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end. And we stop. And in so doing, miss the meat. In the text. Now from this point, you're in trouble. Because I'm going to enjoy this sermon, whether you do or not. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. 
You see, it's a prayer text. But you don't catch that if you stop Nixon at verse 11. My second text, leave you hanging there for a minute, is in Revelation 18, old Adventist text. Oh boy, come on, find it. Revelation 18. There's a little ring in this mic, gentlemen. I know y'all can fix that. All them techies up there. <laughs> Revelation 18. After these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. You've read that, haven't you? And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon, the greatest fallen is fallen, is become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. Lord, have mercy for all nations. Verse 3, have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. My Lord, and I heard another voice from heaven saying, what does it say, church? Come out who? God's got people in Babylon. See, the subject is God hears prayers in Babylon. And y'all thought I'd lost my mind. But now I'm reading you a text that says that God's people are in Babylon. If God's people are in Babylon, and we're a praying people in praying times, that says to me that God's people are praying while in Babylon. Therefore, got my proof text now, therefore, God hears prayers in Babylon. Somebody say amen out there. Took me a while to get there, but I got there, didn't I? So we need to expand on this because what are God's people doing in Babylon? Why does God have to call his folks out of Babylon? Now, Revelation 18 and Jeremiah 29 are tied together. We're going to get there. Babylon in the Bible represents all that is confusion, all that is evil, all that is rebellious, all that is anti-God. For some reason, God in his wisdom decided to make Babylon the symbol of all wickedness and rebellion. And that city, in contrast to Jerusalem, the city of our God. You got that? That's old Adventist stuff. And these two cities, particularly in Bible prophecy, are at war one with another. God's people have no business in Babylon. They're to be in Jerusalem. Are you following me? But Babylon this symbol of wickedness, if you study it in Scripture, understanding begins to come because God's people being in Babylon is a choice of God's people. When you read the Jeremiah setting and the Isaiah setting, all through these prophetic books, God keeps declaring, listen to me today. God's people keep, God's, God's word keeps declaring to God's people, look, if you keep acting the way you're acting, if you keep disobeying my word, if you keep with your hard-headed, stubborn determination to have your way and have God at the same time, I'm going to have Babylon come and take Jerusalem. Are you listening to me? See, we have no business in Babylon, but because they would not hear the word of God, because they would not obey, because they wanted to have both sin and righteousness, because they wanted to have both their vigilance and their pork, because, Lord help him. Somebody help this preacher. Because 
because they wanted to mix up both good and evil, God says, the only way I can catch your attention is to let your carcass go to Babylon. Uh, let me make it plainer to you. There's not a person who winds up in the kingdom of glory who doesn't first make a trip to Babylon. Because Babylon is our choice. We weren't born to be in Babylon. We weren't born to be adulterous. We weren't born to smoke. We weren't born to drink. We weren't born to spend God's tithe money. But since we like Babylon so much, God says, I'm going to come and take you there. You don't like Jerusalem. You don't like the kingdom of glory. So before I take you to the permanent kingdom of glory, I'm going to take you to the city that you live like you are. You got a Christian face, you got a Babylonian nature. So, since that's where you want to be, that's where I'll take you. But ha! Ah, the brother's subject is God hears prayers in Babylon. Didn't I say what I was, that's what I was going to preach on? I got news for you. Well, can't get there yet. Can't get there yet. You got to get the Babylon concept. You see, the Babylon concept starts in the book of Genesis. I read Genesis 1, ends in verse 31, and the Bible declares, all that the Lord made was good. I read Genesis 2, and in Genesis 2, it tells Adam and Eve, leave that tree alone. You got all these other trees dripping with chocolates and vegelinks and <laughs> carrot juice on that tree. Yes sir. yes, sir. Everything you need is on that. Why you want to go to that tree over here where the caffeine is? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Want to go to that chicken tree? <laughs> ha! Yes, sir. All these other trees are your trees, but you've got to have this tree. And so, and so, and so, and, 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 and Eve knew what he said because when the serpent said to her, don't touch, uh, 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 eat, she said, God said, don't touch, don't touch, don't go to Babylon. Verse 6, Genesis 3, but when the woman saw the tree, that it was good for food, pleasant to the eyes, the tree desired to make one wise, she took to Babylon. Sin began because man was not satisfied with what God provided. And so the human race chose Babylon. We like Babylon. The reason why God has not poured out his spirit on the church in the last days, there's just too many Babylonians amongst us. See, the purpose of prayer is not just to get you out of Babylon. It's to get Babylon out of you. Can I get a witness in this place? Hey! God, in his desperation, understands how we are, understands our confusion, understands our lack of appreciation for the things of God. The church is crippled because we're trying to be both this and that at the same time, trying to have our way, God's way at the same time. He will not have it. He'll straighten you out if he's got to break you up. And he will break you up. Somebody say amen out there. Thank God that he's willing to break me up. Thank God that he will not let me alone. Thank God he will embarrass me, harass me, break me expose me. Somebody say amen out there. Make me poor. Make me cry. Thank God. He doesn't just drop me in Babylon. He takes Babylon and wears me out.
That's why when you married out of the church, it didn't work. Did he say that? Yes, he sure did say that. That's why wearing that jewelry don't make you prettier. Did he say that? Yes, he sure did. <laughs> yes, sir. You see, there's the Israeli look yes. and there's the Babylonian look. And so and so what I like about God is, see, even see, see, see my subject is while you're in Babylon, he hears you pray. That's the subject. And what I like about God is when you think he's left you, he's with you. When you think he's abandoned you, he's carrying you. When you think he's through with you, he's just starting with you. Hey! Hey! See, the Lord, scratch, the devil you thought he had, see the devil thought when he got you in Babylon, Winston, he had you. But the Lord, see the Lord takes the devil's bad stuff and turns it into his remaking stuff. Of course you got cancer from smoking. Of course you did. That's Babylon. That's God remaking, reshaping. Because now in Babylon, you cry unto the Lord. And I done read a text that tells me God hears prayers in Babylon. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Now let me get to my text. That was the introduction to the sermon. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. This brother ain't got no sense at all, does he? But I'm more than halfway done. So stay with me. Our text is Jeremiah 29, 11. Let me tell you how that text got in the Bible. If you read, you turn to Jeremiah. If you read to Jeremiah, me and my wife are reading it through right now, having a good time. Sister Wright is very keen with Scripture. Woman got an eye for truth. Many of my sermons come from conversations with Sister Wright. I ain't going to tell you which sermon, so I get all the credit. <laughs> but she seeds her husband's mind with wisdoms from Scripture. In Jeremiah 28 and 27, the setting for our text is laid. The people have chosen Babylon. So they are there. See, God will give you what you ask for. So you stop asking for it. You want that relationship? He give it to you. Let that Negro come on in your house. Lord, Lord, address him up fine, so forth. Now, he ain't righteous. He ain't good. He's asking things that's going to take away your salvation. But you want him? God, God, God puts muscles on him. Nice, nice waist. Nice, firm hips. God brings him on in. You want Babylon? God fixes Babylon up real good. And by the time Babylon gets done with you, you're just so good. All you want now is fat, nice, and... You threw with Babylon. Hey, is anybody listening to me out there? I'm back in Jeremiah. Jeremiah, Jeremiah, Jeremiah 20 and 29. So they're in Babylon. That's where they wanted to go. God lets them go there. Well, while they're there, see, and God says, God says to him, Steve, he says, look, you're going to be there 70 years. 70 years. So some prophet shows up in Jeremiah 20, Hananiah. Says, thus saith the Lord. In two years, you're going to be back home. Mm -hmm. Jeremiah comes walking in church with yokes on him. Mm -hmm. yeah. No, y'all, he walking. Y'all ain't going home. You're going to be there for a long time. Mm -hmm. Hananiah rises up, takes a hatchet, and knocks the yokes off of Jeremiah in front of everybody in the church. Thus saith the Lord. It's all in the Bible. I'm just summing it up. Thus saith the Lord. Two years. 
Jeremiah says, not only you're not coming out in two years, but Hannah and I, you're going to die. Once that scene takes place, the Lord then says to Jeremiah, send a letter to the folks in Babylon. See, Jeremiah 29, 11 is a part of a letter. You can't take that text out of context. It's a part of a letter. I'm reading Jeremiah 29, verse 1. And these are the words of the letter. See, I didn't make this up, Brother Pastor. I did my, I did my homework. I read the commentary. And I read the Bible. These are the words of the letter that Jeremiah, the prophet, sent from Jerusalem unto the residue of the elders which were carried away captives, and the priest, he's sending a letter to Babylon. They're in Babylon. God makes contact with his people in Babylon. See, if life is going rough, see, I got to talk about this for a minute. If life is going rough, you ain't got no money, you're sick, your home is falling apart. If you're living in Babylon, remember, God makes contact with folks in Babylon. I read my Bible and I read somewhere in Luke 15 that when the prodigal son was in a pig pen with the smell of pigs up his nostrils, all of a sudden his head got clear. And the Bible says in Babylon, he came to himself. I didn't make this sermon up. God gave it to me. So he sends a letter through Jeremiah the prophet to the folks in Babylon. Verse 2 tells about who he sent it by and all that so forth. Not important to the sermon. Verse 4, thus saith the Lord God of hosts, the God of Israel, unto all <laughs> that are carried away captives, whom I've caused. See, stop all your complaining. You chose Babylon, you in Babylon. So I carried you away. Now, Babylon has a double meaning. It, it, Babylon is first all the mess you in that you chose for yourself, and then Babylon is the world around the church that we shall not be delivered from until Jesus comes. What I'm saying to you is the church right now lives in Babylon. Only way out is God's deliverance. But now back here. Verse 5. <laughs> this cracks me up. See, Hananiah said, you're coming home. Two years. Going to be just fine. Don't worry about Jeremiah. Jeremiah's letter says, build houses. <laughs> I'm sorry I'm enjoying this thing all by myself. He says, build houses and dwell in them. Hey, go out there to so-and-so estates, find some property, get yourself a fine house, and make your, get a sofa, get some prospile carpet, buy yourself two Volvos, put them in the garage, because you're going to be in Babylon until I get you out. See, if you're in trouble, it's God's designed trouble. If you've got problems, it's problems God sent. Stop complaining. Build houses, dwell on them, plant gardens. Put some cucumbers in. Get them pole beans lined up. Plant some cabbage and some carrots. Because you're going to be there for a while. God does not release you till he's done with you. Stop trying to run God with prayer. Trying to line God up with prayer. Trying to psych God out with holy prayer. Great God Almighty, who made the stars, who holds the commas in his hand. First of all, he knows what he's doing. He don't need you to tell him. Just get on down to business like Peter, drowning in 55 billion gallons of water. He had no time for all that. He said, Lord, save me. Talking about a noun and a verb and an objective. That's all you need. I'm in trouble. Somebody help me. God help me. 
in the church. Help me. Don't come to church all pious, dressed up like everything's just fine. Your life's a raggedy mess. Get up when the pastor makes a call. Crawl down the altar and say, Lord, have mercy. It don't make no difference what the elders say. They're sinners too, the deacons say. They're sinners too, the deaconess say. That white does not change them. Everybody ought to come down to the altar and cry out, Lord, have mercy on me. I'm, I'm reading my text here. <laughs> Build ye houses, hey, and dwell in them, and plant gardens, eat the fruit. Then he tells them in verse 6, get married. <laughs> Take ye wives, come on now. Beget sons and daughters, and your daughters to husbands, that they may, be, that they may bear sons and daughters. In other words, plan for, plan for grandkids in Babylon. Is anybody paying attention to this sermon? Praying times for praying people. We are surrounded by Babylon. Praying times for praying people. The world we're living in is going crazy. Praying times for praying people. Even our leaders don't seem to sometimes make sense. Praying times for praying people. Many of our members that were steady and ready are now fading away. Praying times for praying people. Standards of the church don't seem to be valued anymore. Praying times for praying people. Lord, when are you going to get us out of here? When I'm ready, in the meantime, you need to occupy in Babylon and do what I have assigned you. I will release you when I'm ready. Now, having said these things, verses 6 and 7, verse 8 of Jeremiah 29, for thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, let not your prophets and your diviners that be in the midst of you deceive you, neither hearken to your dreams which ye cause to be dreamed. In other words, get them false hopes out of your head. For they prophesy false unto, uh, unto you in my name. I have not sent them, saith the Lord. See, when you watch me, hey, I'm almost done here. Get this, get this. When you're going through stuff, beware of people who come to you with all kind of stuff that's not based in God's Word. Some of you are in trouble because you've spent your life listening to the wrong people. Remember what God said to, said to Eve after she ate that fruit? He said, who told you that you were naked? Who you been listening to? One of the functions of prayer is to lead you to the mind of God. By the way, let's clear this up. Prayer was never intended by God to get anything from him. Prayer was intended by God to get you to him. We need to learn to use prayer properly. Prayer is to change you. See, 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 see. If you seek ye first the kingdom of heaven, I'll add the house and the car and the rent money. Seek me first. Prayer, the function of prayer is to find God, get close to God, get to know God. See, when you get close to God and get to know God, then some things you'll stop asking for from God because he ain't going to do it no how. <laughs> Jeremiah says, don't listen to these folk, these, these, these false diviners. For thus saith the Lord, <laughs> that after 70 years, in other words, I haven't changed my mind, accomplished in Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word toward you in causing you to return to this place. Then verse 11, he gets indignant. That verse you like so much, he's actually angry. I know thoughts I have toward you. Don't be telling me, because you're in Babylon, I don't love you. How dare you say that to me? I got you in Babylon because you chose Babylon. I'm going to use Babylon to save your carcass. So don't come to me with no attitude saying, I've forgotten you. Hey, 
I remembered you when I put you in Babylon. That's why I put you there. This is a powerful text when read properly. I know the thoughts. Don't tell. See, we come to God. Lord, you've forsaken me. I know the thoughts I have toward you. Lord, you've left me. I know them. Don't tell me how I feel. Whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son. Don't tell me because you got cancer. I don't love you. I know how I feel. You know what? It's a pretty good sermon. <laughs> How dare you come to God measuring his character against your woes, limiting his power according to your limits and worries and fears. I know how I feel. I died for you. I was crucified. Don't tell me because you ain't got no money. I don't love you. I own the cattle in a thousand hills. I'll give you a dollar bill when you know how to spend it. <laughs> Verse 11 is powerful. God is saying, I'm sick of you coming to me, telling me how I am, how I feel. I know. I've proven it. Therefore, Verse 12. See, I told you verse 11 is a prayer text. You in Babylon, you got problems. It don't look like it's going to get any better. So, verse 12, then shall ye call upon me in Babylon, and ye shall go and pray unto me in Babylon, <laughs> and ye shall seek, and I, and I will hearken unto you in Babylon, <laughs> and ye shall seek me in Babylon. And ye shall find me, hey, in Babylon. And ye shall search for me with all your heart in Babylon. And I will be found of you in Babylon. And I will turn away your captivity while you're in Babylon. And I will get, see, notice, 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 notice. He sets you free while you're in Babylon. Y'all didn't get that. See, freedom is not getting out of Babylon. Freedom is getting Babylon out of you. Is that all right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I can set you free in jail. I can set you free with cancer. I can set you free with a divorce. I can set you free by breaking up that sorry relationship. I can fix you in Babylon. Did you hear a word from the Lord today? Yes, sir. And I will, and, 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 and I, I have driven you, saith the Lord. I will bring you again into the place where I caused you to be carried away captive. I'm going to take you back to Eden. It's going to be a new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. Come on now. No more crime. No more care. No more trouble, no more war, no more sadness, no more sorrow. I'm going to get you out of Babylon my way at my pace. But in the meantime, while you're there, pray. You got it, sis. This young lady got the whole sermon in one word. Pray. Got cancer. Pray. Marriage falling apart. Pray. Church people don't act right. Pray. Pastor, they sit you down to five churches. Nobody in the church has any sense. Pray! Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> Babylon is my anvil. Babylon is my place. Babylon is where I re remake people. Babylon is where I fix folk. The church must dwell in Babylon, but God will hear us yeah. in Babylon. Your heads are bowed. Your eyes are closed. Preacher's done. I need some music. Where's O Heflin? Sing anything that comes to your mind, Heflin.
whatever you and the Lord decide. Your heads are bowed, your eyes are closed. I need you to get quiet now. Praying times. Praying people. We now know how the church got to Babylon. But we read the text. Come out of her. God's about to call his folks, Brother President, from Babylon. Now, preachers, that's going to be something. The church of God finally set free from this sinful world. Do you want to be in that number? I said, do you want to be in that number? Send me something, Paul, with a verse and a course, and then we'll break it on you. You're praying. Part says, What a privilege! Yes, sir. <laughs> and what a privilege it is to carry in Babylon now. Got to learn to pray in Babylon. because you don't pray. camp meeting hasn't it been now you got to capture this I'm I'm not much of a preacher but I tell you this I sure do love you I love God's people I just tell it from my heart God has taught me to accept my existence in Babylon see I heard a word from him Word says, I'm coming to get you. In the meantime, while you're there, call me. I'll answer. Search for me. You'll find me. Seek me. I'm right beside you. See, in case I didn't say it clear, Jesus lives in Babylon. Ha! When he took you there, he went there with you. Isn't that something, David? I want you to capture this now. So maybe there's something you've been wrestling with, something. I don't know what it is. You've been arrested with God. You have not understood his actions, and maybe today's sermon cleared something up for you. You're going through a Babylonian process. You chose to go there. Now he's going to get you scratch he's going to get Babylon out of you then he's going to get you out of Babylon are, are you listening to me so I don't I don't want you to miss this you got to go home happy and rejoicing and thanking God for his immeasurable wisdom in dealing with you you wouldn't have prayed for you wouldn't have had the sense to pray for what God has done in your life so he went on and did it anyhow save you so there's something you're wrestling with 
You need to find peace in Jesus. Paul's going to sing the next verse. And while he's singing, you're going to get up and come. I want to pray for you. I want to pray for you. Go ahead, Paul. Who's coming? Who's coming? President, I'm going to need you to come with me. This is your flock. to sit if you can't come it's all right to come but sometimes we just need we, we need we need to do something public a demonstration we we're capturing a, it's been a it's been a wonderful powerful prayer meeting i felt it when i got on the grounds god's spirit has just been leaping around all over here but folk we're still in babylon you're going back to greensboro you're going back to atlanta you're going back to charleston you're going back to macon here and there but that's still babylon now, my brother, you got good news. When you get to Macon, Jesus is there. Because he lives in Babylon. He did not send me. He walked with me. You got that, young lady? God bless you, sweetie. Yes. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm rejoicing. Are you feeling good right now? This is wonderful news. So we're going to pray. Now there may be somebody standing where the first thing you need to do when you get back is go to your pastor and say, I need to start fresh. I'm going to leave that between you and the Holy Spirit. What we're doing now is making sure that while we're in Babylon, we're yoked up with Jesus. Then I need not fear. Even the alleys of Babylon don't scare me because Jesus is with me. The ghettos in Babylon do not scare me. Yes. Jesus is with me. Yes. Are we going to claim that right now? Yes. Reach out and grab somebody's hand. Brother President, I need you to pray for the saints and for me. The President is praying. Merciful Father, what a joy it is to know that even in the midst of our darkest days, you are there, near us, with your arms of love around us, even when we go through the worst of times, mm. e even when we choose the wrong path, Lord, even when we punch our ticket to Babylon, Lord, you do not leave us or forsake us. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you for the reminder today from your manservant, Lord, that you love us with the everlasting love. And that these trials and tribulations that we go through perfect the characters that you want in the kingdom of God. So, Lord, thank you for not letting the devil kill us. Yes. But for not letting him take our lives and giving us one more day to, to, to make this calling of election sure in Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. If we had a thousand tongues, we could not thank you enough. Hallelujah. Bless your people, Lord. Hallelujah. We, we acknowledge our need of you. Just bless us, Lord. Pour out your mercies upon us. Continue, we pray, Lord, to, to shower your grace upon Elder Wright and his dear wife in, in the new assignment that you have given them. Use them in a marvelous way, Lord, to touch the hearts of the people and prepare us for the kingdom of God. And as we stand here today, Lord, some of us, some of us stand here because we have said to you in our hearts that we're going to make a fresh start from this moment forward. So, Lord, you see us. I lift my hand to you, Lord. I, I just want to be a better person in you. So, Lord, help me, strengthen me by your grace and by your power. And all of us here, 
Remember our children, our children's children, some of those, Lord, who are so deep in things that, that there's have no mercy. way that we see them. Have mercy, have mercy. But have mercy upon them, Lord. Thank you for those who've overcome by your grace. Yes. Thank you for the cancer survivors who stand yes. in front of you. Thank you for those who've been freed from prison, Lord. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And we praise you with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our strength. We praise you, Lord Jesus. And we look forward to the day when we can look up and see you in the clouds of glory. These old feet of ours will be lifted from this earth. And we will hear from you, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the jaws of the Lord. Thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayer this day. For we ask it in faith, we ask it with thanksgiving, and we ask it in the worthy and holy name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Let all God's people say, Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Now, as you, as you go back to your seats, Paul, lead us in that first verse now again. What a friend, sing what a friend we have in Jesus as you go back to your seats. Sing with him now. You know the hymn very well. Everybody's singing. In Jesus. Is he all Lift it up. What a privilege. What a privilege, what a privilege. Sing it, saints.